Hello, you're listening to this exclusive, highly original podcast with me, Neil Humphreys, author of several best-selling books in Singapore, most notably my Singapore trilogy, the Note series, and the Omnibus Complete Notes from Singapore, all available at a good bookshop near you. My recent novels, Premier Leach and Match Fixer, uh, were bestsellers internationally. I am joined today by the Honourable, the Wonderful. Thank you. Dinesh Darianani, who will tell you a little bit about himself now. Well, I, I am Dinesh Darianani. I uh, worked many years in corporate life making some money, and I quit and, uh, like Neil, started writing. I've written, I'm working on my third book now, and run an agency of my own. I'm Singaporean, but I was actually made in Japan, and lived the first 10 years of my life over there before moving to Hong Kong, Jakarta, and then coming to Singapore. And I forgot to add, I was made in England on the back seat of a Ford Cortina. You're listening to our podcast. I'm Indian and he's English. I'm <laughs> well, today we're going to talk about integration, uh, racial, cultural and even social integration in Singapore. A very pertinent topic right now. I only have to say uh, two words and that's curry war. And we'll get to that in a minute, I'm sure. So let's talk about Singaporeans first, how they must interact with foreigners or must they not interact with foreigners? What, are you, what is your experience with foreigners vis-a-vis -vis Singaporeans here? Well, I am a Singaporean. I, I was uh, actually made in Japan because my parents were living there, but born here, uh, lived away for the first 12 years. But And so I've actually had the benefit of interacting with foreigners uh, ever since I was a child. Uh, so coming here, interacting with foreigners was not something I really, really looked at. But I mean, the, the irony of the whole thing about this whole debate about Singaporean foreigners is that the whole country was based on diversity and, and you know, we were formed that way. So the fact that it actually comes out, what, 40 odd years after our independence, it's, it's a bit odd. Exactly. That is a great point you make. I mean, a, a, a dear, dear Chinese friend of mine was saying yeah. to me the other day, you know, there's too many Chinese here now. You know, he was referring to mainland Chinese. There's far too many mainland Chinese now. And, uh, and he used the phrase, this is our country. Very contentious point. Who yes. is our? But exactly. He, he said, you know, this is our country. And uh, I said, that's fine. But how far back do you want to take this whole mm. our country analogy? Because this is a, a predominantly Chinese country in a, Malay Peninsula. Yes. So, do you want to therefore suggest that the hour is how far back do you want to take it? You know, this is a Malay country in, yeah. in, in historical cultural terms. Yes. So, do we kick everybody out who's not Malay? I mean, how far back do you take Correct. this point? You so, know? you're talking about our Aboriginal populations, exactly. indeed Malay, but even. So, sort of somewhere between the Aboriginal population and, and where we are now was the British colonial stuff. And we, we acknowledge Raffles' role in this place. So, and not only that, not only looking backwards, but looking forwards, we're changing so much. So, I mean, you know, you talk about this diversity, it's going to get, it's going to be a hot potato. Mm. And really, I think, I just wonder who is actually bringing this up, you know, because when I look at the younger generation, so I'm 47. I'm looking at people below me, like my, my nieces and all that, who are like very young, like 12, 13, 14. They actually don't talk that way. Yeah. It seems to be the working adults who are suffering, maybe economically, that, that, that mm. are looking for some sort of like maybe blame storming. Exactly. Yeah. And not only do the younger people uh, don't talk about it, they don't even really care. It, it's almost a non-issue. Yeah, I mean, correct. Yeah. You know, when President Obama was elected, the first black yeah, yeah, president yeah. in the United States, there was a lot of talk of, would we ever see a non-Chinese prime minister? And the older generations, without going into too much detail, uh, have recently said that, you know, there will not be a non-Chinese prime minister in Singapore for the foreseeable future. But if you speak to younger people, yeah. they don't really care. They just want the yeah. most competent man for the job or woman for the job. Yeah. To them, it's not even an issue. Race is yeah. not even an issue. Whether it's Malay, Eurasian, Chinese, Filipino, they just don't care. Or even the others, which yeah. is me. You know, the mythical others, whoever they are. So here lies a problem, right? How much of this is actually learned? Because I know a lovely story recently. A friend of mine had a son and was playing a game on the PlayStation or something. And there was a white boxer fighting a black boxer. And my friend asked, hey, son, you know, couldn't figure out who his son was controlling. And he said, hey, son, which, which boxer are you? And the son, without batting an you know, eyelid, said, dad, I'm the one with red shorts. And that completely flabbergasted him because, you know, it seems to be this whole race thing, you know, us versus them is a very learned behavior. And how do we stop that? You know, that's, that's, yeah. and so it's, it, it is, it is very, very artificial. It is extremely artificial. Yeah. And we have to, as a country, we have to undo sort of 
taught, if you like. They are taught mm. prejudices. You're yes. not born racist. Yeah. You're not born intolerant. Yeah. You know, when I was a teacher in Singapore, and it's it's naive, it's idealistic, it's very we are the world. Yeah. But one of the f my favourite images was this uh, Indian boy. Yeah. And this uh, Chinese girl, when I was a teacher teaching nursery class, they was yeah. about three or four years old, and they were cuddling and kissing each other on the cheeks. Oh. You know, and in my naivety, I said, wouldn't it be wonderful if that could just go through it? Our whole life because look it could happen would you like me to cuddle and kiss you now well, I was waiting <laughs> I was waiting for the invite but it didn't happen so uh, you didn't you shave know, we're not born racist we're not born intolerant we're not well, these things are we have to be honest they are passed down through the generations and they can be sometimes passed down through society okay so so how do we change this now because you know obviously people are talking about this and 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 uh, you know is it really a, a matter of being uncomfortable uh, because so many new people are here or is it a matter of people feeling stressed so they're looking for you know someone something to, to sort of blame or latch on to like this is my country so you know leave it for me i mean i'm not entirely sure how to solve this really we're talking about racial social cultural integration in singapore and now we're going to talk about what we as singaporeans and non-singaporeans yes. indians and angmors alike can do to integrate in Singapore because we can't always say our ah, government our ah, government got away on the government government must do it for us we have to take responsibility for our own actions and we have to make more of an effort you can't say and I'm speaking now as an expat you can't say oh the locals are always complaining about expats you know we, we when you're on a bus and I saw this you're on a bus a packed bus going through River Valley Road and the Angmors were moaning because oh the hot water system wasn't working properly in their condo you know their luxury five star condo and it was such a hardship and their life was so unbearable and you know it just wasn't worth going on with when at the time I was living in a one room flat in Topayu that had no hot water and you know a number of HDB flats still have no hot water so you have to be very careful you have to be more culturally sensitive when you're in a different country you have to behave in a different way you have to be more appreciative of the people around you you can't be on a bus bitching and moaning about you know your, your, your swimming pool's not at the right temperature in your condo when there are people people around you who of course are going to resent you because they don't have these things and not only do they not have these things they make do with things that they have that are nothing like you know three or four bedroom condos or whatever so you have to be i think more culturally sensitive to the singaporeans around you yeah i, I think as a singaporean i need to what i make an effort to do is to distinguish a jerk from where they come from mm. so my point there being you know if, if neil you did something that i didn't like you know being boisterous and and drunk and all that as some of us do I'm well not, i have to do something <laughs> with my monday nights <laughs> No, so, no, no. no, I'm just joking. But, but you know, then I, I, I shouldn't say that all foreigners from, you know, Caucasian countries are like that. I go like, you know, this guy is being a jerk. And, you know, I think that's something that we really have to be careful not to sort of project one yeah. bad behavior upon, upon and making sweeping statements. Yeah. 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 You know, and I think that that's, that's a big, big danger. And it works both ways. I mean, look, I've written books over the years that have made, have made considerable fun. Uh, at the expat's expense, at expense, you know, poking fun at expats. And then I remember at a book launch, an expat turned up at the book launch and there was a lot of people there. Yep. And she said, not every expat in Singapore is a jerk. And then she removed what I didn't realise was a wig to show that she was completely bald because yeah. she'd shaved all her hair off for a Singaporean charity. Oh, so, of course, yeah. I was extremely humbled by that. So, yeah. of course, I would never say that every expat is an absolute yeah. jerk any more than I'd say that every Singaporean is intolerant of uh, foreigners, expats, order because yeah. it just isn't true. Absolutely. Yeah. But we do have to make more of an effort uh, to integrate. And we have to talk about the infamous curry story, of yes. course. Yes. Everyone in the room now is getting nervous. No. And I'll, before we talk about that, I'll give a specific example. Um, the apartment I'm staying in now is owned by mainland Chinese couple. And the apartment opposite me is owned by mainland Chinese couple. So there's no denying the increasing prevalence of mainland Chinese in Singapore in the last five years. When I, this is absolutely true, and you're going to think I'm making this up, but I'm not. When she came round to inspect the apartment, she was very anal. She was not very aware of Singaporean culture, sensitivities, and so on. We had actually just been cooking uh, curry. Well, when I say curry, it was Ang Maggie Maggi noodles, but you know, it was it was Maggi Mee curry, curry flavor noodles. Right. This is me cooking. I can't yeah. cook, but the smell of curry was in the was in their apartment. Yeah, and she came in and she speaks no English, and my Mandarin is you know Edian Dian, so we we got by. But she complained about the smell. 
she complained about the smell. She actually held her, you know, pinched her nose with her fingers, which is a very offensive. She was complaining about the food or something. No. The smell, the smell. <laughs> my, my wife complained about the food. But she actually complained about the smell of curry in her own apartment. Right. Obviously, completely oblivious to what's just gone on yeah. in Singapore in the last couple of months, you know. But it was an interesting microcosm of what is going on right now. Here we have, you know, uh, foreigners, you know, myself and the owner, living in a Singaporean apartment, complaining, or she was complaining, about the smell of, you can't get more Singaporean than Maggie Me, let's no, be honest, yeah. uh, complaining about the smell of that. And I thought, you know, we've we still got some way to go here. You know, we've still got some way to yeah, go but, here. But, yeah, the curry incident was very, very interesting to me because curry was is a curry is a curry. And, you know, being English, you know it's a national dish mm. of England. But it's very interesting how it was divided, how some people were calling for curry as a matter of protest, Mm. Whereas the other half was saying, let's use curry to unite and educate. And in fact, I wrote a letter, which was picked up by today, that you know, I call for basically cooking curry, inviting all your foreign friends, Chinese, non-Chinese, foreigners, what have you, and to enjoy a pot of curry. So again, you know, it's like you can take something and look at it in two different ways. So, you know, there's a lot of personal responsibility, what we were saying before about how you look at things. And that, I, I thought the curry, curry incident was, was a brilliant example of that where you really had two camps. Yeah. And look, I invited people around for my curry Maggie me, but no one came. I don't know why. <laughs> but, uh, but no, you're absolutely right. And I think it was, it was interesting that it came up. It was a very um, divisive issue but it was one that we needed to have it was a discussion that we needed to have absolutely because yeah. i will say this categorically as a foreigner uh if you're a foreigner in any country yep. i've just returned from australia where i was a foreigner there yep. um you have a you have a responsibility you have a social and civic responsibility to integrate it is your role it is your duty to integrate mm. and, I, and i don't care what race you're from it's not relevant the race side of it is not relevant yeah you know you've got if you go into someone's home you make an effort to be hospitable and to it's integrate about- yourself into that person's home because they've invited you into their house. You must behave a certain way and, and, and so on and so on. Now, this is the same for me and this is the same for everybody else. It's the same for the expats. Now, I live now in, uh, in Bidok. Yep. Now, if you go to the, the fancy eateries around Katong and, and Sigla, you'll see expats everywhere. Yep. You go to the Bidok Hawker Centre, I'm the only expat there. I'm the only young more there. Yep. Uh, something's not right there. You know, something is not is yeah. fundamentally not right there. I we must make more of an effort to integrate. It cannot come from the top down. You must take initiative yeah, yourself. No. It's about being ultimately. It's about being a decent human being it above is. all. All That's you exactly know, so what it is. you need to strip all the race and stuff out of the equation. And really, at that at that level, it actually boils down to the family unit. I mean, how are you bringing up your own kids? Mm. You know, what example are you setting? Because really, you know, that's that's all it is. You know, it's human decency. Yeah, and and on the flip side to that, there yeah. is a. There's an inverted snobbery or, or a positive racism, if I can call it that, okay. where, you know, let's be frank, the old stereotype, we've all seen the, the old sitcom Under One Roof, yes. where the daughter brings home an Angmo boyfriend, I yep. think it was Mark Richmond, yep. and the mum was so happy, oh, he brings home an Angmo, he brings home yeah, an Angmo, yeah, he's yeah. so happy, so happy. Likewise, when I was living in Topayu, uh, I'd get in a lift. Yeah. And the aunties would get all excited. Oh, I'm more. And from the first floor to the 11th floor, they'd get my life story. Where are you from? Oh, you live here. How many children? You married? You got kids? You got this? You got that? This is, you know, one lift journey. Taxi drivers yeah. the same. Oh, I'm more. You live there. You married. You married to local. You married to this. You know. And it was wonderful. Yep. But I'll be brutally honest. In that same lift, I have seen construction workers get in the lift and those same aunties get out. Wow. They won't, they won't yeah. share the lift. Right. Because he's a construction worker or because he's Indian. Maybe that's too sensitive, but it happened. I saw it with my own eyes. Yeah. Ang more gets in the lift. Whoa, Ang more. So exciting, so exciting. Indian construction worker or Bangladeshi construction worker gets in the lift. Different story. Eyes to the ground, no conversation. That's at best. At right. worst, they get out of the lift. Wow. So these are yeah. also, what do you mention? This comes, you're not born thinking this way. You, you know, it's this learned, is a, you see it. And, and sometimes you know, it's learned subconsciously. You know, Absolutely. It's not, yeah. you know, an auntie or an uncle doesn't sit there and go, you will talk to Angmors and you will not talk to construction workers. It is a subconscious yeah, awareness yeah. that grows from seeing it with your aunties and your uncles over here in conversation over the mahjong tiles or at the Sunday afternoon dinner around, yep. the, around the table or things that you inadvertently see when you're getting on and off the school bus that this foreign construction worker is ignored or this uh, domestic helper Filipino Indonesia is likewise yes. ignored yeah. but the Angmo why is Angmo oh, it must be a big shot oh, lots of money condo big car and all this so until you get rid of this what is reverse racism really you yeah. know you're, you're highlighting or promoting 
races and putting them on the pedestal at the expense of other races, Correct, yeah. we need to overcome that as and well. And also I think we need to look at, ask ourselves the other question, like what will life be in Singapore for Singaporeans without all these people here? It will be miserable. Be because boring. it will be boring, you know, it will be less diverse, you know, it won't be exciting. We'll have we'll have too few people to do too much jobs, you know. You're absolutely right. And you know, so we need to also ask ourselves, what if they were not here? You know, and I don't think people are asking these questions. They ask, you know, they look they, it's very self centered. It's all about yeah. the dollars and cents. And it's about themselves. It's about, mm. you know, it's about me, me, me. So I think they need you know, we need as Singaporeans to get over there is some of this Kyasu mentality that we have. It is ingrained to some parts of it and we need to get over that as Singaporeans I think I agree completely and that was actually a key reason why I left Australia now I know many Singaporeans see Australia as almost this utopia you know Perth you know we must retire, retire to Perth with yeah. lots of grass and it's big and it's this and it's that but Gra- I, grass is illegal here by the way oh yeah sorry yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was on the floor trying to smoke here and it, <laughs> right, and it okay. didn't work it, it didn't oh, that work that was a smell it wasn't a curry then <laughs> no everyone thought I was a cow you know it didn't work at all but I, I left Australia ironically uh, because it was just too damn dull and, I, and this is not a criticism if Australian expats are, are hearing this and if you are an Australian expat you probably agree with me anyway but it was just too damn dull it was too white bread I mean I use the analogy of white bread in the literal sense of most people are Caucasian but white bread in the sense that Australian suburban lifestyle yes it's like white bread you'll get what you need from it you can sustain yourself from it yep. but after a while it gets bland and repetitive I'm a multi-grain man and, I like, and not I, nutritious at all no yeah that's right there's no nutritious value I'm a multi-grain man right. I like the different tastes and flavours and textures and nuances you don't get that in, in, in Australia and you get that in Singapore and it's one of Singapore's greatest attributes and yes. I did not come here for money I must stress that I'm a writer for heaven's sake you right. know I earned more money in Australia than I did in Singapore. I came here because I like the multi-grain lifestyle. I want my daughter to be a part of that. Right. When I saw Australians, and this is something for Singaporeans to think about, when I saw Australians, because it was such a multi, a white bread culture, I'm talking away from the cities now yep. in Australia, they're hicks. They're you know, hicks some yeah. of them are hicks. They're like rooting, tooting, truck driving, hillbillies, you know. Right. And when you live a small-minded, a small-town lifestyle, yeah. you tend to get a small-minded mentality. It's inevitable. Yeah. You know, there's racism, yes. there's sexism, and you step into some of these Australian towns, and it's like you should be on a rocking chair on a banjo. You know, it's like dueling banjos, <laughs> cowboy, Hicksfield town. You know, you're scared to walk anywhere. Singapore doesn't want to become like that. No. You know, no. and you are... And, you don't become like that if you're multicultural, if you're open to different cultures, open to different people, and open to different ways of life. Yes. And it's all, I wonder, you know, on that note, I wonder how many, you know, I, I always think about America sometimes. When you talk to um, Americans, uh, the reality is that many, many generations ago, before, like, even, even older than us, they were Italians, they were Spanish, there was this, that, and the other. But today, they call themselves Americans, you know, and that's the, how they identify themselves. I wonder whether we're actually in that, in that phase where we're moving away from, you know, identifying with Singaporean slash race. I talk as a Singaporean now. Mm. When people ask me, I just say Singaporean. I don't say I'm Indian Singaporean. Exactly. You know, so I wonder whether we're at that inflection point where the next generation the race issue just disappears and you know we're just going through this this boom period where we're exploding so quickly that we're adjusting and it's really not a long-term problem Mm. it just happens to be a topical glitch because of the speed of expansion of new people coming in i hope you're right when president obama got elected the thing i said at the time was i hope now americans lose the hyphen african american You know, white American, yeah. uh, Chinese Singaporean. The hyphen is irrelevant. Yeah. It, it has, I don't understand. I understand politically and historically why African Americans call themselves African Americans. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not. That's a different argument altogether. Yeah. But if you could, at some point down the track, you are a level of uh, acceptance. Yeah. Where it really does become an irrelevance. Yeah. You're yeah. Singaporean because I happen to live in Singapore. Yeah. I'm Singaporean because I happen to live in Singapore. The rel- where I was born is just something on my birth certificate. Correct. It's yes, not yeah. important. Yeah. If I'm in a hawker centre with you and, and we're having prata together, as long as you don't eat my egg prata, we're all happy. You know, yeah. it doesn't matter what race you are, what religion you are. It's not important. No. Yeah. We need to lose the hyphen. The egg prata is not multigrain, by the way. What? That's, no, that's it. it. <laughs> where do you go for your prata? The organic Australian prata shop. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. <laughs>